Good afternoon, or good evening, as the case may be. I'd like to welcome everyone to the third and final panel of the Schiller Institute Conference, Will Humanity Prosper or Perish? The Future Demands a Four Power Summit Now. My name is Megan Beats. I'm with the Schiller Institute in the United States, and I'll be moderating the panel this evening. Just a note by way of housekeeping, in the previous panel this afternoon, we were unable to show a presentation by Mark Swayze for time reasons, so we will be posting that video on the conference page so that it can be included in the proceedings and people can view that. So the title of this evening's panel is The Job of Youth. And we are going to begin with a musical offering to set the tone for our discussion. So what you'll hear is Mihua Steger, who is a member and organizer with the Schiller Institute in San Francisco, California, performing Johann Sebastian Bach's Prelude and Fugue in C minor from the Well-Tempered Clavier.
If we look back through history at moments of great revolutionary change, we see that most of them have been brought about either in part or on the whole by youth movements. The Italian Renaissance, the American Revolution, the Apollo moon landing. This is not by chance. There's a principle involved, a principle that Lyndon LaRouche recognized going back to the very beginning of his own political activity in the 1960s and in the decades since. Young people do not just represent the future, they create it. They are not necessarily trapped by the old, failed axioms of the previous generations. To quote Percy Bysshe Shelley, young people resonate with the gigantic shadows which futurity casts upon the present. Today is no different, and today's huge crisis requires the leadership of youth, but youth who are qualifying themselves to lead this new paradigm of civilization. So let me introduce our speakers on the panel tonight and give you a sense of how this is going to work. We'll hear first from the leader of the LaRouche youth movement, Helga Zepp LaRouche, followed by Daniel Burke, who is a leading organizer with the Schiller Institute and is also currently a candidate for Senate in the state of New Jersey. We'll then hear from a number of different people including some of the people who are leading the effort to reach out to and educate young people in various parts of the world. Carolina Dominguez Cisneros in Mexico, Sharin Sultan in France, and you'll also hear from some of the young people who have been participating in an ongoing series of dialogues with Helga Zepp LaRouche and in making organizing interventions into their own nations on behalf of the policies for a new paradigm. You'll hear from Jose Vega in the United States, Sebastián de Bernardi in Peru, Andrés Carpintero in Colombia, Daniel Dufresne Arevalo in Mexico. You'll hear from Franklin Mireri from ULEAD in Tanzania, Arij Atef in Yemen, Sara Fahim from Morocco studying in Paris, and Lissy Brobiag in the United States. We'll then go to a dialogue where you'll hear more young voices who are part of this growing chorus. So before I turn it over to Helga, I'd like to go to a short clip from the founder of the LaRouche Youth Movement, Lyndon LaRouche. This clip is from an address that LaRouche made to a gathering of young people, the LaRouche Youth Movement, in February of 2003. And what you'll hear him discuss is both the power, but also the responsibility of youth. Historically, only a certain kind of youth movement can change things. Your generation, as those among your generation, who are still alive and viable, are confronted by the fact that your parents' generation gave you a no-future world. There's no way you can, make a, you can make a deal with this culture, which prevails today. No way, because you can't survive. This culture can't deliver you. So, you know that. What do you do about it? You know that you don't have a future unless you can change society. But you're a generation which is not in a controlling position in policy making of society. So what you do is you go out like missionaries and begin to organize the dead generation, your parents' generation, in society. And you see the impact you have when you go into these various places like the campuses that go into places such as the state legislatures or the Congress. You see the effect you have. The presence of four or five or six of you walking in knowing what you're talking about, which is more than most of these legislators can do, huh? and others. You have an effect on that. And this, what, what happens then is, is not magical. Is principle. Whether people know it or not, the difference between man and a monkey is the fact that human species can do what no monkey can do, no ape can do, no Gal Gore can do. Actually, 
actually assimilate valid ideas of principle and transmit them to the next generation. That's the difference between man and the ape. Man is capable of discovering universal physical principles by a method of discovery, which is illustrated by Plato's dialogues, or illustrated by the case of, of Kepler, or illustrated by the case of Gauss, or the case of Leibniz. Man can do that and transmit these discoveries about what's out there in terms of principles in the universe and transmit this to new generations. These discoveries and their transmission increases man's power in the universe per capita and per square kilometer. Therefore, the most important thing about man is society. We all die. Everyone is going to die. Mortal life of everyone will come to an end. So you've got a mortal life, what are you going to do with it? How long it is is not the most important thing. It's what you go out of this life leaving behind. And what you leave behind? You leave behind younger people. You leave behind successive generations of younger people. You leave behind what you transmit to them, what you contribute to their development to the circumstances of their work and life, to the conditions of society, which can to coming generations. And when you're, when you're wise and you're living in the generation, you think about dying. Not in the sense of morbid thing. You say, I'm going to die eventually. Now, while I'm still here, I'm going to get a certain job done. And my job is to guarantee the degree I can contribute to this that the next generation will have everything we have in terms of knowledge, and the, the next generation will have a better life than we had. And the future generation will benefit from what Okay, so now we are going to go to Helga Tsepp LaRouche, who is joining us from Germany, who is the founder and chairman of the Schiller Institute. Helga, are you there? Yes. Okay, go well, I just want to uh, bring to your attention a very important writing by Friedrich Schiller, according to whom the Schiller Institute is called. And that is, why do we study universal history? Uh, this was an address which uh, Schiller gave to students in Jena in 1789, where he basically talked to a room full of students, like you, know, you are now assembled here on this webinar, and he said that the fact that we have assembled here, and you can actually refer this to our situation as well, you have to take all of universal history into account. All of you come with a very specific history, family, background, cultural experiences, something which made you join this webinar. And he basically then uh, says that it is that which brings people together, which makes them uniquely qualified <clears throat> to respond to the historical moment in which they are. Now, we would not be here without the man you just listened to, namely my late husband, Lyndon LaRouche, who, you know, was really the most spectacular, knowledgeable. He knew just about everything. But, you know, he ran eight times for president. He was known throughout the world. We had many leaders in India, in Mexico, in African countries, who all expressed one thing, namely that <coughs> he was about the only American they could trust. And he had developed a unique method of scientific knowledge, of forecasting. He predicted every single aspect of the situation in which we find ourselves. He talked about a pandemic. He talked about the systemic collapse of the financial system when it was absolutely not apparent uh, because everything supposedly went well. <clears throat> but if people would have listened to him, we would not be in the situation we are now. He had an incredible vision of where mankind should be, which is expressed in a beautiful movie he made woman on Mars, it's expressed in his writings, the Earth's next 50 years, 
which you know were all extremely visionary ideas where mankind should be. But I want to emphasize one quality which I think extincts him from all other people because he had the most unbelievable passion for mankind. And since it's now not so fashionable that you know young people should have passion for mankind, I would like to encourage you to take that specific aspect, the agape of Linda LaRouche, because if we are going to save civilization and you are going to save civilization because it's your future, I think you need exactly that incredible love for humanity. And then there is no problem which is unsurmountable. And that's really what I wanted to tell you. Thank you very much, Helga. So next, we're going to hear from Daniel Burke. Daniel is an organizer with the Schiller Institute in the United States, and he will speak to us on the topic of if you sat where they sit, what would you do? Daniel? Thank you, Megan. The Schiller Institute has convened this conference with the urgent goal of bringing about a summit of the leaders of the so-called four powers. Russia, China, India, and the United States. I address my presentation to the youth of the world to encourage them to investigate for themselves what should be the character of such a summit. Or without a personal notion of what should be accomplished, how can you genuinely demand this meeting to occur? So my question is, if you sat where they sit, what would you do? You can also stand, sitting is not mandatory. But it may be useful to begin by asking uh, just who is it that we're sitting in for? Not in the sense of who are Trump, Putin, Xi, and Modi personally, but rather what is a national leader and what are their ab obligations? So what authority is conferred upon you when you take their place? And where does that authority spring from? Some, like John Bolton, I think, would say that the authority of the US presidency lies in its vast power, its military power, its power to kill. These are the heirs of Thrasymachus, outright Satanists who in fact, a they obliterate the notion of authority by crowning force supreme, force without regard for its author. This concept of authority is exactly what has been preventing such a summit from taking place. It's like Mike Pompeo's doctrine of deterrence, kill them first before they can do anything wrong. To many Americans, the source of a president's authority lies in the notion of democracy. Since we elected our president, he gets his authority from the will of the people. He should represent their will. These are the people who put not my president on their bumper stickers, um, but it you know, raises a question, which is, what if your citizens have become a bunch of raving degenerates on account of the misleadership of the past or their own moral failings? What if their will is to take drugs and play video games? Then that would make for a terrible summit. If we change our approach, and say that this authority comes from the consent of the governed rather than from the will of the people, an obvious question follows. By what authority do individuals confer their consent? In our nation's Declaration of Independence, we answered this question by appeal to unalienable rights conferred on all human beings by their creator, to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Ultimately, therefore, the president's authority, and indeed the authority of the leader of any sovereign nation, does not derive from the people or even from the Constitution or the Declaration of Independence, because no words jumped off the page to give him the keys to the White House, but rather 
it comes from the natural rights of the human individual in the living image of God. Should life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness be promoted, the obligations of that authority are fulfilled. The same concept is known in China as the mandate of heaven. So this creates another problem, which is that you have to figure out what this thing called happiness is. And if you're depressed, you're gonna to have to give that up. I submit to you that the greatest happiness is that which corresponds most closely with our unique human characteristics. We are not animals. We are creative creatures. We think, we discover, we devote ourselves to the future, not to the present, to the future. Here, I can disabuse you of the idea that you're important because you're youth. It's not so. You're important because you're humans. And I'm gonna quote from Mr. LaRouche. Natural law is the hypothesis which corresponds to the necessary and sufficient reason for mankind's con successfully continued existence. That is to say, human progress in the universe toward a greater and greater mastery over its principles is an essential function of that universe. We're acting on behalf of the universe of, when we do that. As the German-American space pioneer craft Erika put it, by expanding through the universe, man fulfills his destiny as an element of life, endowed with the power of reason and the wisdom of the moral law within himself. So I think it is not at all an exaggeration to say that the authority of these four leaders to create this new paradigm depends upon the future colonization of the solar system and implicitly the galaxy. In that that is the most human thing that we can do. Their actions today, these leaders, are necessary to the task before us which will have been vitally important to creating that future. Today, we have to overturn the unjust rule over world relations by Thrasymachus. He has palaces in the city of London and in lower Manhattan, and we should repossess them. And his weapons of mass destruction, the financial derivatives, should be buried in a cave where they can't harm anyone. And if we act in that way, then we can unleash a Promethean age. We can create miracles such as the founding of a freedom from material want for every human child. Where, you know, a future where even the moon and the earth, who have been lovers forever, according to Percy Shelley, they will finally marry. And the ceremony will be held at the founding of the first international moon village. And in case you think I'm too optimistic, I'd like you to consider the words of Lysander Spooner from his 1860 treatise, The Unconst Unconstitutionality of Slavery. He says, natural law may be overborne by arbitrary institutions, but she will never aid or perpetuate them. For her to do so would be to resist and even deny her own authority. It would present the case of a principle warring against and overcoming itself. Instead of this, she asserts her own authority on the first opportunity. The moment the arbitrary law expires by its own limitation, natural law resumes her reign. Here I find then the job of the youth. Regarding yourself, not as youth per se, but as practitioners of the natural rights of man, discover for yourself the limitations of the arbitrary law of oligarchy, which has prevented humanity as a whole from acting in accord with natural law. What are the limits to a tyrant's power? Where is the weak flank of the enemy? I think it lies in the flimsiness of the postmodern paradigm, so-called. The prevailing narrative 
tells us that we want to be free from judgment, free from responsibility, free from rules or limits on our behavior, free Wi-Fi, or increasingly popular, we're encouraged to run society the way that the big tech firms run social media. Block anyone whose views differ from you. They're not human, and you're justified in ruining their lives by any means necessary. And stacked on top of those narratives is the meta-narrative, namely that the universe as such is fundamentally unknowable, and that narratives are how we impose meaning on our lives. While we all acknowledge with a knowing glance that such a task is in fact meaningless. You can know whether you like death metal or lo-fi hip hop or K-pop, but you cannot know the meaning of your life and history. You can know if you identify as left libertarian or right authoritarian, but you cannot know how to end poverty. Poverty, human suffering, these are merely part of the pastiche, the millimeter deep collage of experiences that comprise our lives. That fraudulent and quite satanic view of the universe is a weak flank. Across the world, the real physical economic conditions have asserted themselves. The passions of the people are erupting and being manipulated to drive us further toward the mass killing of the impoverished populations of the world. But, uh, it's my faith that a small number of people committed to developing a higher and more beautiful concept of the nature of man can sound a certain note and change the course of history. And it's my view that this is not a hopeful wish, but it is hope itself upon which we've always depended. So ultimately, Will you find within yourself the moral leadership to cause yourself and others to discover the principles of natural law? Thank you very much, Daniel. Next, we're going to hear from Carolina Dominguez Cisneros, who is leading the LaRouche Youth Movement of, the, or I'm sorry, the Youth Movement of the Schiller Institute in Mexico. And she'll be joined by three Others, Sebastián de Bernardi in Peru, Daniel Dufresne Arevalo in Mexico, and Andrés I'm sorry, Carpintero in Colombia. And the title of their presentation is Getting Back the Great Ideas That Were Stolen From Us. Good afternoon. My name is Carolina Dominguez from Mexico. I'd like to welcome you to this international conference, which is a result of the efforts of the Schiller Institute, which I have been a member of for a number of years. I would like to share with you our enthusiasm and hope in creating an international youth movement. Throughout his life, Lyndon LaRouche and his movement, which we are part of, defended the idea of creating a youth movement that studies the most profound ideas that humanity has produced. These profound ideas represent the creation of new institutions. LaRouche always said that if you want to educate a president and transform a society, you should create a youth movement. And that is what we have done. Este movimiento de jóvenes que the youth movement which we are now creating is based on the idea of giving youth what has been stolen from them in their universities, their schools, and in general. Les han robado la idea de que they have stolen from them the idea that they can know the universe, they can understand the universe, and master the principles which run the universe that man lives in. Y aparte de entender in addition to understanding those universal principles, they can take them master them, and apply them for the welfare of all society. As you have seen throughout this conference, it is essential that youth and the new generations master these concepts. So our work in Mexico, Colombia, Peru, Chile, Argentina, Venezuela, and in general in Spanish-speaking countries, 
Esta tarea que nos hemos dado the task we have taken up is to gather together these youth who are interested in transforming history, in being participants in an international process with other youth who are not willing to be told by the media that yes, this is a sad situation that lots of people are dying daily, but rather that they have to change it. They cannot just wait to someday be part of those statistics, but they have to act. And that is what the La Rouge movement exists to do, to be that guide. We have weekly meetings studying Kepler, the astronomer La Rouge tasked us to understand. Kepler showed how human beings are able to understand those principles, and he left us documents that allow us to understand his method and his thinking. We also study Friedrich Schiller. Right now, we are reading the letters upon the aesthetic education of man, which has totally stunned the youth about how they have been denied all these ideas in the universities. The younger people in these meetings are the ones who are most struck, thinking that their education has only been to learn things, pass an exam, and then forget them. Now they recognize, by participating in our movement, that the knowledge and method they are learning is useful to transform society. So the message I want to give you is to join and participate in this movement. I don't expect you to agree with all of the ideas that we have discussed on these panels, but I do believe that we have all felt at some point that things are not right and that it is necessary to do something to assume responsibility as young adults. The following messages that we are going to hear are from youth whom we have asked to comment on what they think of the work we have done with them. Youth from Peru, Colombia, and Mexico, who have taken up the opportunity to know the ideas that were stolen from them in their formal education. So I invite you to participate in this. We have meetings every week, and this movement is growing. All of the work which Lyndon LaRouche developed has allowed us to master ideas that will help us change history and not be reconciled to a totally uncertain future. That is my message to you. We are here so that all youth can participate in this process. Thank you very much. Buenos días. Soy Sebastián de Bernardi de, de Lima, Perú. Good afternoon. My name is Sebastián de Bernardi of Lima, Peru. I wanted to tell you about a dialogue meeting that we held on June 17th with the participation of Schiller Institute youth from Latin America on the subject of the proposal to create 1.5 billion new productive jobs in the world. That program is in response to the economic and health crises globally and to the urgent need of the population as a whole to have greater development for their lives and those of their families. Various great projects proposed for our countries by the Schiller Institute can have a major impact both on the creation of jobs that improve the quality of life for people, such as access to a better education and culture to be able to carry them out, as well as benefits they would bring in the short term. The dialogue meeting was characterized by a shared optimism as a result of the joint search for answers to the problems of the age, which are overwhelming our countries. And so we met virtually this time, hoping to be able to actually meet soon as a result of the completed great projects. Hola amigos, mi nombre es Andrés de Bogotá, Colombia. Hello friends, my name is Andrés from Bogotá, Colombia. I'd like to invite you to get to know the proposals of the movement that Helga and Lyndon LaRouche have created to reverse the economic and social entropy that has brought us to the chaos we are in today. We need to learn and acquire the tools to create a clean and sustainable future inspired by reason, morality, and art. 
We youth will build the world of the next 50 years. Join and participate in this marvelous movement. Hola, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo están? Soy Daniel. Hi, how are you? I'm Daniel, and I'm very happy to greet you from Mexico. I have a very important message for you, especially the youth. We are living in a world that is changing ever more quickly, but the only thing that hasn't changed is oppression by the powerful, who are toying with the world's people. We are living in mankind's most important age, a mankind whose purpose is to grow and improve those aspects of life which make us human, love, passion, joy, and methodology. The powerful have taken all of this from us, and they will continue to do so unless we change this reality. Fortunately, there is a plan. A plan inspired in the profound thinking of Lyndon LaRouche, which essentially is an educational for fighting against the problems caused by the sick ambitions of the Wall Street and City of London circles. That plan requires the greatest possible number of youth with their dreams and hopes in order to make a better world in which to live and not merely survive. The Glass-Steagall Act will be implemented, the banks will be quarantined because they are bankrupt, and the toxic derivatives bubble will be frozen. We will demand that the leaders of Russia, China, the United States, and India meet to decide on the next stage of industrial growth, which will allow us to grow more while using less. Utilizando menos. Conectando al mundo con cientos de miles de kilómetros de vías férreas. Connecting the world with hundreds of thousands of kilometers of high-speed rail lines, creating more than 1.5 billion jobs in the whole world. The time for changing the world has arrived, and we need you now. Let us fight now to make this reality possible. Let us all fight to free the world, to bring down national barriers, to eliminate ambition and hate. Let us fight for the world of reason, for a world where science, where progress lead us all to happiness. Brothers, in the name of freedom, we must all unite. Okay, so you've now heard from the United States and from Ibero-America. We're going to go across the Atlantic now, where it's much later at night. And we're going to hear next from Franklin Mureri, who is the Partnerships Coordinator for ULEAD, which is an organization I think he'll tell you something about, which is based in Arusha, Tanzania. Hi, Franklin. Hi, hey Megan, nice to hear from you. Nice to see you, go ahead. Thank you, it's a pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen of the world, fellow citizens, allow me to greet you in the famous Swahili greeting, Jambo, which simply means hello. My name is Franklin Mireri from Kenya, representing the ULID program. ULID is East Africa's flagship youth leadership and development program working to unlock youth leadership potential for a prosperous region. ULEAD is a collective action youth program hosted by MS Training Center for Development Corporation, MSTCDC, and the East African Community Headquarters here in Arusha, Tanzania. It is co-owned and supported by the ULEAD consortium of over 25 uh, state and non-state partners across the six East African countries and member states of the EAC. We are cognizant of the wonderful work that is being done by the Schiller Institute in advocating for and mobilizing governments to respond definitively to the current crisis, especially through the efforts of impassioned youth across the world who are committed to taking responsibility of persuading their governments into action. Last month, you lead, together with the consortium organizations in the six East African countries, launched a survey report on the disruptions of the coronavirus to youth life in East Africa. The survey, which was conducted between March and April, laid bare the startling socioeconomic impacts of COVID-19 to the livelihoods and of, uh, to the livelihoods of young East Africans. 
59% of the respondents had experienced severe negative impacts to their income. And this was just at the beginning of the crisis in March. 57% had experienced severe impact to their education, while 34% were not working from home because of the nature of their work. We believe that the economic impact will be more severe in developing countries since many countries do not have social security safety nets. At ULEAD, we are developing an, off, an online a jobs platform for East African youth to mitigate the economic effects that have been brought about by the coronavirus. The platform will bring together skilled youth and potential employers on the same platform with an emphasis on verified skills and a scoring system from successfully completed tasks, which will build trust. The platform will provide three distinct features, a platform to reskill and retool youth, a one-stop shop for employers and employees, and a youth employability passport, the YES passport. And finally, skills and jobs without borders. This is to overcome the perennial challenge of labor mobility in East Africa. The creation of 1.5 billion new jobs across the world and dedicated financing for efficient health infrastructure in every country will definitely require more than just talk. Sadly, many of the noble ideas that have been advanced in the past, like the Millennium Development Goals, then the Sustainable Development Goals, the Global Goals, and action towards curbing climate change have been clawed back because of a lack of leadership. The greatest want of the world right now is for true leaders, leaders who will not be bought or sold, leaders who are true and honest to the plight and the needs of their citizens and humanity, leaders who do not fear calling impunity and servitude by its name, leaders who will stand for what is right though the heavens fall. Allow me to end by quoting a famous Swahili phrase, Hakuna Matata, which means all is well. I'm sure most of you have heard that saying in many cartoons or animation films. The phrase appeals to the optimistic good nature spirit of human beings all over the world. The truth is that the, well, the world is presently faced with a uniquely challenging combinations of threats on every side. This is the time for decisive action by everyone, young and old, rich and not so rich, from every religion, race and kindred. If we do not move and act decisively together, the consequences will be dire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Franklin. Okay, next we're going to hear from Sara Fahim, who is a student from Morocco who is studying in Paris, and she's been working alongside our Schiller Institute uh, friends in Paris, France. Hello, Sara. Hello, everyone is hearing me? We can hear you fine. Yes, okay. Um, I took the initiative to express my thoughts on the situation young people face in my country and across Africa because many inequalities are still present there today. Several phenomena are at the source of the failure of these young people to enter the professional world. Morocco is a divided country. Politics have unfortunately made of the national educational system something seemingly reserved for less privileged social classes. There are way too many students and they are growing apathetic towards a school system that does not, does not lead them out of poverty and towards success. There are way too few teachers and they are discouraged by mediocre conditions and educational structure. Then comes in the paramount problem of language. In public school classrooms, French is not well thought, even if at all when this language is, especially since the French protectorate that ended in 1956, is essential in today's job market. This language, as well as the Arabic language, is spoken daily across the country. These young people then find themselves less trained, pushed aside, and see their future constricted by these conditions. At the same time, another part of the population is benefiting from quality teaching 
the educational system itself has never before been this developed. This minority has access to an education that, while expensive, still guarantees admission in prestigious, prestigious universities, as well as very good jobs, the best in the country. This evolution has led to a very real crisis, driven by the loss of confidence in one school, its role, efficacy, and equality. Public schooling, though supposed to bring children from various backgrounds together, as opposed to segregating them, has failed. This observa observation is a real threat to African developments. Governors do not act with the required urgency to repair and invest in young people's educations to offer them training that will ensure job acquisitions down the line. This is how creating job opportunities, as mentioned in the LaRouche plan, will be achieved. Indeed, we need to remember that in the 60s, economists created a positive correlation between humans in human investments and economic growth. The development process, process of industrialized countries, as well as developing countries, has been historically shown to accompany a general growth in the skills and education levels of their population. The essence of creation of job opportunities lies in education, which is one of the strongest weapons against mass poverty. It might be time to support Africa in the development process. I always wondered if there was this conscious will to deprive Africa from development and education for its youth. Can knowledge be dangerous? The answer to this question came to me when I paid closer paid colonialism in this continent. It is important to understand that in today's world, as claimed by Rouge studies and conferences led by the Schiller Institute, every country's prosperity contributes to the well-being of the general, general population. To me, 19-year-old, the only way to save the youth from this vicious cycle is to train them. Exposure to social media is stronger than ever nowadays. We must use all digital resources we have access to and take advantage of this potential. With around 364 million of African age 15 to 35, this continent has the youngest population on earth. The United Nations predicted that Africa will be home to over 40% of the global youth population by 2030. The challenge of how to successfully integrate these young people into the formal economy needs to become a top priority for governments, policymakers, and development practitioners. I was lucky enough to be born to a couple of hardworking parents that had the privilege to offer me an education that could help me succeed. I want this opportunity to become a right. The children of my country, of my continent, of the entire planet deserve this right. We live in a paradoxical reality between a youth that is sabotaged by our educational system and this enormous potential young people have coupled with the will to act and in an awareness of the battles to come. It is our duty to provide them with the necessary tools and new job opportunities will naturally follow. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Next, we're going to go to Shirin Sultan in Paris, France. So she will be speaking in French. First, I'd like to make sure that the translation is working before we get underway. Could you say something, Shirin? Est-ce que vous m'entendez? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, we okay. hear you. Okay. okay. Oh, wait, I'm sorry, wait, we have one. It's very interesting. Wait, wait, wait. It's interesting, but help. Please pause one moment. Well, I got an echo. Yeah, please pause for one second. We have to just fix one thing. Ah. Okay. Okay. Here I get again an echo. Yes, I think we have to make one change and then it should go away. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to everyone for being patient. We have definitely a Jerry rigged a translation okay. situation. <laughs> okay, could we try one more time? Just a test? 
Shirin, could you say something and we does that does it function? Yes. Can you okay. hear me? Okay. okay it's, it's okay. Now we're working. Go ahead. So I would like to thank Sarah to have developed this question of digital as a chance to develop youth. But I would like to to pass through the negative point of the digital culture today and see what we can do. We could call that the younger and the digital and the future, how to employ digital. Because often you get children whose parents are telling them, you have to work before spending money, earning money. And you have to get good results at school. And when you have a good result at school, the parents are saying, well, I'm going to give him one hour of television, one hour of internet, because he's deserving it. So it's a kind of pathway to push children to education. But the problem is that the good result at school are not so, so good because the level has been doing, going down. So international studies, which are measuring competencies of children in the OCDA, they're showing that there is a, a lowering of the level and inequalities in the measurement of the levels. So this success is not at school, but we see the young people have a lot of success on the social networks. That is the new way to have success. So you see that on Instagram, on YouTube. And uh, the objective of those medium is to be seen to have a lot of viewers, viewers. And so the young people here wants to be influencers. It's becoming a competition. And a negative point in that is some of them are becoming they, they are becoming sellers, man, management sellers, even against their will, but they are just selling things, selling themselves, selling products. For instance, uh, makeup, clothes, drinking. And, and so imagine that for the, for the very famous uh, influencers, they can have $20,000 for some minutes of video. And some of them are under 18, so the parents are uh, dealing with that. And some of them are very happy to have this money because of the unemployment. So that is a big challenge. Because I'm just asking the question, who is gaining, who is earning the money really? Actually, that is the, the people, it's not the people who are selling the product, that is the, the one who are, they are the, the companies. Because the companies are uh, just using those young people to sell things. So we can see that the videos are, you know, touching more and more people that, uh, you know, uh, advertising in the metro stations because it's very, uh, it's very spreading on the internet. And so if you know Edouard Bernays on propaganda, he developed the concept of advertising, this idea of uh, making people just commercialize to, to sell people was already developed. So one of the favorite hobby of the young is TikTok today. TikTok is one of the main uh, occupation for the children. So it's TikTok. So I don't know how many million of young people are, uh, you know, uh, inscribed and are subscribing to this network. So you have a lot of young people who are dancing. You have to 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 manage to do a perfect dance movement on the video to enter in the application and you can share the video. You can, no, you can do it again and again before sharing it. 
And so you're repeating all the movements. And now you have children who are in classroom or at home are doing the movement without uh, unconsciously. So there is kind of robotization of the movement of the body. So, so yeah, the behavior is, is not, is modelized by this kind, kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, dance and all things. So the people are more and more, you know, sharing uh, their pictures without really going uh, um, in other places. Like they're they are staying at home, sharing pictures and not traveling, not, not doing so, so many travels to, to share. So finally, so the people are becoming slaves of social networks. So we could say that those young people are wanting, want to be influencers They're kind of, they're kind of, you could say that yeah. hmm, I, I'm trying to, to get the idea. So yeah, you have a lot of those young people who have access to a higher degree and they want to be uh, not influencers as such in the social networks, but they want to build startups. And the problem is that even in this uh, world of the startup, the small companies growing up, there is a, a trap because you need a lot of finance at the beginning and the finance is coming from the big companies. If you don't have money at the beginning, if you don't have money to invest at the beginning, you have to, uh, you have to, uh, uh, yeah, you, to submit to the big, big companies like Google, Microsoft, and you will have to work for them because, for instance, in France, you have something which is called Station F, which is a startup incubator. Like you, you have a lot of young people work doing things. And to go in that, you have to pay a rent, you have to, and if you want to have access to employment, often you have to be uh, dependent of a big company like GAFAM, like Google, Microsoft, Facebook. And if you are clever enough to, to develop something, uh, the big company will help you, but you will be under the, the circumstance, I mean, under employed by the company. So your competence is used by uh, the, those big companies. So you have, maybe you are clever, maybe you, you, you've done good studies, but we have to change the social, uh, you know, social environment and, this, and, the, and, and, and the economic environment to be sure that the intelligence of people is, is used for the common good, not for those who have power. So the question is, who will be the instructed uh, politicians? Because now you have a lot of politicians who are discouraging. Uh, they are um, they are very they, they are showing a lot of mediocrity. Who is which is. Uh, So, if you want to, if you want to be a, a real startup, startup to change the system, you have to join our movement. If you want to start to develop as a young uh, student, uh, you have to join our movement to study how Kepler discovered the solar system. That's what we are working on. Uh, that's what is determining our capacity to understand the the, the laws, the four laws that Larouche has developed, for instance. So on that, I wanted, I wanted to thank you, uh, and I give the mic to others. Thank you very much, Sharin, for that challenge. 
Now we are going to go back across the Atlantic, um, back to the United States, to Lissy Brobjerg, who is an organizer with the Schiller Institute, who formerly in Denmark and now in the United States. And her uh, speech is, Are You a Large-Scale Geological Force? So Lissy, go ahead. Thank you, Megan. Can I be heard? Yes. Good. So I will begin with a quote from the great Russian-Ukrainian biogeochemist Vladimir Vanatsky. The new sphere is a new geological phenomenon on our planet. In it, for the first time, man becomes a large-scale geological force. He can and must rebuild the province of his life by his work and thought, rebuild it radically in comparison with the past, wider and wider creative possibilities open before him. Now, what will your role be in the shaping of future geological phenomena? How will future geologists see the irrefutable trace of your life in their geological studies? Will the soil reveal but your biological remnants or a large scale noetic geological force? Vanatsky revolutionized the study of the nature of life and uh, looking into the chemical composition of soil he observed that all organisms create a whirlpool of atoms passing through the body by way of respiration, metabolic activity, and reproduction. This process tends toward manifesting itself to the highest degree. And furthermore, the evolution of species has a directionality which is not random, but which increases this biogenic migration of atoms. Looking at the buildup of fossils and life in the ocean, we recognize a steady increase over geological time of the biomass, fleshiness, metabolic activity, energetic lifestyle such as predation and swimming, and increase in food supply. So let's look at a few examples of this. 400 million years ago, the sponge class Slerospongia was dominating. Afterwards, they declined and the class Demospongia and Hexactinellida took over the dominance. The living tissue of the old class was confined to a thin veneer outside a two-dimensional skeleton. Whereas the new classes had developed erect, interlocked three-dimensional skeletal structures which enabled them to inhabit areas with strong currents, utilizing the water flow for nutrition and thereby increasing their biogenic migration of atoms. At the same time, the dominating corals were of the orders Tabulata and Rugosa. After they went extinct, Sledactinia took over, whereas the old orders were barely able to attach themselves to the substrate making them vulnerable to disruption, Sledactinia, through its ability to cement itself to the substrate and build large colonies, could sustain communities that were able to survive even severe storms. Such communities underwent symbiosis with microorganisms, which enabled them to inhabit low nutrition environments. Then, 240 million years ago, the only orders of Articulata, a class of brachiopods that did not go extinct, were those that developed strong pedicles that enabled them to optimize their position in currents and those that developed their feeding system to filter through more water for nutrition and prevent the influx of indigestible particles. At the same time, the dramatic increase of the diversity of bivalvia, a class of mollusks, was due to the development of full mantle fusion and siphons, which enabled it to burrow more efficiently and thereby um, invade new ecospaces. 
So these are examples of the directionality of life toward maximum manifestation and evolution directed through the increase of biogenic migration of atoms in the biosphere. Now, the new sphere, the domain of the mind, is able to direct this increase through cognition rather than biology. In Vanatsky's words, since the appearance of civilized humanity tens of thousands of years ago, the face of the earth transforms itself and virgin nature disappears. Our thoughts are able to change the chemical composition of the universe like no other species and over short time spans through exceptional individual contributions. So shall your life then be reflected mainly through the biosphere or through the new sphere? Do you choose to become a large scale geological force? What would Shakespeare say? Be not self-willed, for thou art much too fair to be death's conquest and make worms thine heir. Thank you, Lissy. Next, we have a short video message from Arij Atif. Arij is the vice president of ed the education committee of the BRICS Youth Parliament in Sana'a, Yemen. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to be able to talk with you about the youth at the present time and the future. I'm Arij Atif, the vice president of the education committee in the BRICS Youth Parliament. The experience we got from the BRICS Youth Parliament has given us the ability to see two world systems, the old and the new. All the thanks for the available knowledge of the LaRouche Five Keys to advance the BRICS countries and its definition has reached Yemen in English language and Arabic. As I'm responsible for the health education in the BRICS Youth Parliament, I stress that all youth of both gender have the will to face the war and policies viruses like they are able to face deadly viruses and that is through the right health education which is built on physical economy which we have learned from the late London LaRouche. As for the beauty of Yemen, the civilization of Yemen has a fragrant smell. This civilization is the identity that triggered the report of happy economic miracle because of the pairing of the old frankincense trail and the new silk road. It is a model report that all countries should pursue its rules. Finally, I would like to share with you that in the coming Tuesday, we will be celebrating World Parliamentary Day. The world has been celebrating this day since 2018 so that they can encourage the development in the parliamentary work. So if the world is going to celebrate this day, let the Alliance Collagen in Yemen be elected so we can achieve the sustainable development goals nationally and internationally. And thank you. Okay, thank you to Arij, who is doing some very important work in Yemen. So our final speaker for the presentation portion of the panel today will be Jose Vega, who will speak to us from the Bronx, New York City in the United States. And his presentation is called A New Space CCC. Hello, everybody. I'd like to start by reading a quote by Schiller, uh, later put into song by Beethoven. Be embraced, O ye millions. Here's a kiss for all the world. Brothers above the canopy of stars, a loving father must surely dwell. Do you feel him near, O ye millions? Do you sense your creator world? Seek him above the canopy of stars. Above the stars he must reside. I don't think even Beethoven realized it, but he was actually calling for a space program long before Kennedy. Through ca classical composition, Beethoven's entire symphony serves to develop the ideas and essence of Schiller's poem, which is that of mankind's beauty under the image of the creator. Beethoven was incredibly challenged to set the music to the poem, saying that it may not have been possible to create a symphony as beautiful as the poem. Beethoven's composition of the Ninth Symphony is similar to the Apollo space program, in that it required the composer to make new creative discoveries that would allow for such a composition to even exist. 
in our pursuit to seek a loving father above the canopy of stars, we must make new discoveries that'll enable us to go farther and faster than ever before. But what does it take to actually accomplish this? Martin Luther King Jr. wrote in his letter from a Birmingham jail, Human progress never rolls in on wheels of inevitability. It comes through the tireless efforts of men willing to be co-workers with God. And without this hard work, time itself becomes an ally of the forces of social stagnation. What does that mean to be God's co-worker? It demands that you use everything you have, no matter how big or small it is. And that requires big thinking, not small-mindedness. Take the poorest district in the United States, which has the highest COVID transmission and infection rates, the highest level of poverty and drug use, and also the highest amount of essential workers. How can anyone who lives in these conditions be expected to believe me when I tell them that humanity is greater than this and that within them is the potential for greatness? Well, truthfully, they no longer have a choice. They have to believe me because if they don't, the country and the world around them will implode. The fight for an honest future begins with those who need it the most because it is within them that the real future begins. We must demand a New Deal era policy where a new kind of conservation corps is brought about, and it will be called a Space Civilian Construction Corps, where anyone between the ages of 18 to 26 is allowed to use their God-given right to develop their creative capacities to bring forth a real future. Suppose the people who go through the program are now running around building hospitals in their communities where millions will be born long after their deaths, and building schools where those millions will receive an education similar to theirs. These same people start developing higher forms of energy flux density where it'd be more expensive to send you a bill every month than to actually power your home. But then they go beyond their communities and even their own countries as they get older and other programs start popping up all over the world, they become teachers, passing down what they've learned, so that those they teach can do for the world what the original group did for their country. I would like to think that Martin Luther King Jr. would agree with me when I say this is one of the highest forms of nonviolence. I'd like to finish off with a quote from Beethoven's Choral Fantasy. Only when love and power are wed, mankind has God's blessing. So with that being said, are you ready to be co-workers with God? All right. Thank you very much, Jose. So we're going to move into our question and answer session now. And what we're going to do is we have a number of young people who I mentioned earlier are part of the Chorus of Voices who are organizing, educating themselves on, and demanding a new paradigm. So we're going to bring some of them in to ask questions of the panel. And what we really want to build here is not just some kind of formal Q&A, but a real discussion with the panelists. Now, what uh, we are going to start with a question, or maybe it's a comment, you'll have to tell us, from an honorary member of the youth movement, State Senator Theo Mitchell. Senator Mitchell is, as I said, a former state senator from the state of South Carolina in the United States. He is a board member of the International Schiller Institute and a longtime friend of Lyndon and Helga LaRouche. And he's also a longtime fighter, courageous fighter for justice. So Senator Mitchell, welcome. Can you hear us? Oh, we can't hear you. Hold on just a second. Can you try it again? No, we're still not getting audio from you. Can you make sure your microphone is unmuted? OK, Ooh. maybe we'll have to come back to Senator Mitchell. OK, so so. Put that on pause. We're going to come back to Senator Mitchell, try to solve those audio problems. Um, so in the meantime, what I'd like to do is I would like to go to a question from our 
uh, panel of questioners assembled in the Zoom meeting. We're going to go first to Maddie Hurst. Maddie, are you there? Although it says my oh, uh, my video has been disabled. Okay, well we can hear you, so why don't you go ahead? Um, I wanted to. Oh, uh, there it goes. There's my uh, video. Okay. Um, I wanted to thank Jose first off for that impassioned speech because that's what we need. We need somebody who's going to connect with people. And I also wanted to note on a kind of theme, I guess you could say, that's been throughout the entire program, and that is that history is made by individuals. Every single one of us has the potential to change the world. And unless we act on that, the future we all dream of is not going to come into being. That's mainly what I wanted to say. Okay. Well, Jose, do you want to start us off? Sure. Um, yeah. And it, uh, it's, um, sorry, I, I heard myself threw me off a bit, but to your response, yes, it is true. History does is changed by individuals. But what good is writing the greatest symphony or a great treaty or the greatest essay if nobody's going to read it or listen to it? You really have to um, organize people around your ideas. Um, it, you know, Martin Luther King Jr. was an amazing, amazing uh, reverend, preacher, organizer, and nonviolent promoter. But it's the people around him. It was the people who organized with him that really made that possible. So I don't think you can forget about the uh, unsung heroes, as, as we put them, because uh, they're just as important, if not more important. I'll just say one thing. Um, I know that there, uh, uh, there is a, um, a great uh, philosopher from the 13th century whose name is escaping me at the moment, who writes about civilizations that were so great that were lost to war and famine, and no one has ever heard of them since. So how do we stop that from happening to us? And uh, that requires um, uh, everybody to come together to, to, to prevent from getting uh, uh, lost and uh, destroyed. Right, well, I think that raises uh, to a certain degree what Shirin was bringing up about the culture. And I wonder if Shirin would like to come in on this and say something. We might just need to pause a moment to get the translation situation set up. Oh, no, she's in English. I forgot. Okay, Shirin. You hear me? Yes. Um, I don't know what exactly I can add. Um, creativity is a um, is um, a big word that um, attracts people, and um, often we don't know exactly um, what we are talking about. And um, when you are really creative, maybe you don't recognize it uh, um, in the in the time. Um, but uh, if you if you are Mm, confident uh, in the long time, uh, finally you will see the difference between um, a false creativity and the true one. So I would like to encourage people to um, to uh, to make this uh, tough work to work art, to work uh, science, to uh, to work that uh, with other one because. Uh, do it uh, by yourself is quite difficult. <laughs> yes. Great, thank you. And for any young people who are watching this, we do have uh, classes, the exact kind of group educational sessions that Sharin was referencing. So I would invite you to get involved in that. Would anybody else on, on the panel like to respond to Maddie before we move on? Okay. Okay, well, it looks like we have Senator Mitchell back. Senator Mitchell, could you say something? Let's see if we can hear you now. 
Hmm. No, we can't hear you. I'm not sure what's going on. No. Well, maybe we'll take another question from the, um, So um, why don't we then take another question from our um, from our Zoom meeting here um, while we fix Senator? I'm going to go to let's see. I'm going to go. Alvin, and then perhaps after Senator Mitchell, I would like to go to um, perhaps Vicente or Mauricio. So Vicente yes, or Mauricio, if you could if you could um, raise Run your hand in Zoom if you're ready. Okay. Oh. Is that Senator Mitchell? Well, yes. Oh, I'm hello. Being fixed. Oh, we can hear you. Okay, can sir. You? Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. I certainly want to pay my respect and regard to my good friend Helga for having the temerity to put on this panel, uh, this conference, and certainly uh, to Lynn. My longtime friend, too, uh, in giving recognition to his contribution and his foresight and his perspective as far as even today is concerned. It's really uh, perplexing to see that we are living in a time, an administration that has little interest if at all in doing the right thing, especially in the exoneration of Lyndon LaRouche. I have been active for quite a while with the Schiller Institute. Uh, in fact, we dealt with the, the um, Operation Fruit mentioned and the human rights abuse concerning Lyndon. And the operation for mention, of course, was targeted at the African-American elected official. We made mass bring that to a standstill or a halt. And consequently, uh, we don't know what, if anything, Lynn paid the price for, for he served time for nothing. He was abused. Former Attorney General Ramsey Clark said that it was the most chronic case of abuse of the so-called system of justice that he had ever seen. And this man was in the Attorney General's office or in the Cabinet office. Consequently, came out in support of land. We all did. I'm happy to know that there are so many young people who are now participating in this in this saga. Got a lot of work to do. We always have to remember this. To be able to get the justice that land deserves and the exoneration we're going to have to press people into the service as far as this world is concerned. How can we get it when it's still abused? No matter what you talk about as far as the four conferences are concerned, the four power conferences are concerned, they're not going to spend one nickel on time on Lyndon LaRouche, especially this administration. This is a program that we certainly can't forget, but it's something that we must continue working on. Of course, at this time, uh, the um, 
abuse of the police departments, George Floyd, then the one in Atlanta, Arizona, Miss Avery, Mr. Avery. I mean, it's, it's an abuse. It's open season. Still, open season on the black male. And consequently, I'll ask this distinguished panel, what suggestions, if any, do you have to be able to help save us and to exonerate our good friend, Lyndon H. LaRouche, Jr. Thank you so much, Senator Mitchell. So um, before I turn that question over to the panel, let me just say that we will put a link in the video description to the petition to exonerate Lyndon LaRouche so people can go there. There's also a really wonderful video on Lyndon LaRouche's exoneration, which um, people should watch and, and help us disseminate. So let me turn that over to the panel. Maybe we could start with Daniel and see if you have a response to uh, Senator Mitchell's question. Oh, hold on, we can't hear you. No? Your microphone's muted, apparently. There we go. How's okay, that? go ahead. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you, Senator Mitchell. Thank you, Megan. Um, I'd like to respond by saying that the most important thing that we can do, in my view, is to create 50 million new productive jobs in the United States and 1.5 billion jobs in the whole world. Uh, this is not a jobs program. This is a fulfillment of what Mr. LaRouche was fighting for in his life. Uh, it is a policy of transforming the human species to a new and more noble level of activity. Uh, it means that we're going to be invigorating all Americans with a mission for the future, because it is only by means of the future that we have any ability to unify Americans. It's always been that way. We've always been fighting for a more perfect union to fulfill the promissory note, note known as the Declaration of Independence. And it's in that effort, as people uh, commit themselves to creating such a future, I believe, that we'll be able to solve the uh, abuses of people that exist, that, uh, in tolerable crimes that are committed against people in the name of, uh, in, I mean, for all types of justifications. Um, we're going to have to take a look at a universal standard of man that demands of us that we fight with such a passion to overcome the brutality of this system in all of its representations by establishing a scientific optimism about the future. So, um, you know, to put it very directly, I think that uh, I, I am perhaps more optimistic than you are that we could get this administration to exonerate Mr. LaRouche. I think that uh, this is a time for miracles and whatever it is that you, that, you know, whatever circumstances stand in our way that are uh, appear to be uh, objective. The fact of the matter is that their system is in a total breakdown crisis. And so the rules that have been set up to keep this system going are crumbling because the system is crumbling. Uh, so therefore, I'm committed to the idea that it is possible in a short amount of time to create a breakthrough on the recognition of Mr. LaRouche in the United States, and that perhaps the most important thing we can do, in addition to fighting for his exoneration itself, is to recruit people to this vision that he developed, which includes uh, taking the people of the, the post-industrial cities of the United States, taking the people of uh, the, the poor areas of our nation, and giving them a means to contribute to the future, uh, this is how we're going to give people a deeper identity and get them out of a feeling of nihilism and despair, which is clearly inundating the country. Okay, would anyone else on the panel like to say something in response to Senator Mitchell on the issue of justice? Jose, yeah, go ahead. 
Black Lives Matter, why isn't there a space program in the Bronx or in Oakland, California? That's my response. See, um, I live just a few blocks away from Governor Morris's grave. And um, Governor Morris was the uh, person who penned the Constitution. And he also wrote the words to the preamble of the Constitution. And in it, there's a section of promoting the general welfare. So if we're promoting the general welfare, well, doesn't that include developing the minds of all Americans and giving them the opportunity to uh, uh, develop the mind, uh, excuse me, to, to educate our youth? Um, I'd like to reference the story of uh, Khalif Browder. He was wrongfully put in Rikers Island prison and over a dispute of stealing a backpack. And he was there for three years. His mother could not afford bail. And eventually he was found innocent. He refused to plead guilty to a crime he did not commit. And uh, three years after leaving Rikers Island, he committed suicide. There was no more hope. There was no future for him in his mind. And that is a tragedy. And that is what's happening to many Americans today. Many young Americans today who have no, who feel as if there is no future and that there is no hope. So we will give them one. I'd like to also reference uh, uh, Plato's Mino dialogue, because in the Mino, Socrates and Mino, a slave master, are having a discussion about virtue and where does knowledge come from. And uh, Socrates says, "I'd like to see one of your slave boys." And so Mino brings out a slave boy and. And Socrates asked about the slave, uh, was he born here? And can he speak the language? These two things imply that this is not a native uh, a Grecian. And this is somebody who does not look like them or may not even sound like them. Um, and what he does is he brings him to the beach and uh, he tells the boy to double the area of a square. What does that mean exactly to the slave boy? Now, the slave boy does it, and the slave boy is not learned. He's not studied at all. He's never gone to, nobody's ever taught him anything, and yet he was able to uh, find the solution to a complex geometrical problem, which is not so complex. So the point is, he could just as easily be the slave master, um, uh, or, or as Mino could just be a slave. So the way we're going to solve this just develop the minds of, of people so that 50 million years from now, when everybody owns their own galaxy, what will the questions be? Will the questions be, do black lives still matter? Or what do they become? How do you transform the future in that way? So I'll leave it there. Yeah, Franklin, go ahead. Thank you. Uh, uh... It's been wonderful hearing from the from fellow panelists and uh, even from Senator Mitchell and how passionate uh, he is about uh, the issue of exonerating uh, Lyndon LaRouche. And I think while many people outside of the United States may not have heard of Lyndon LaRouche, personally, I first heard about him this year when I started even taking the economics classes being offered by the Schiller Institute. While many people may not have heard about him, what I know resonates across the world is what he stood for. For example, the way the financial systems are currently skewed against developing countries. So that's just one aspect that as we even seek, as we even sign the petition, let us not forget the importance of global solidarity towards that cause. So you may never know, just the more people get to hear the wonderful work that he did, the more gradual pressure might be put on any administration. It may be this administration or the coming one, but ultimately what he stood for was greater than just in the United States. That's my submission. Thank you. Thank you, Franklin. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us, Senator Mitchell. Um, so I'd like to go back to our Zoom call, our uh, collection of young panelists there, and actually, um, Calvin, I said you could go next, but first I want to check and see if
Yeah, I would like the, uh, uh, to ask the panelists if they can clear me a doubt that I've been thinking about. Uh, today we see, as we can see, uh, it is inevitable uh, and it is impossible. We cannot uh, uh, Im uh, implement all these projects of the LaRouche movement and the Schiller Institute without The, uh, the concepts for embracing uh, globalization and there is alternatives like the multipolar world and this is talk about uh, in BRICS, uh, the new Silk Road. And so I wanted to, to say that these are all uh, new alternatives for globalization, but uh, as we can see in nature as so as in the spirit of, of in the human, uh, there doesn't exist multipolarity. So uh, um, I wanted to ask if the new embracement of multipolar world for globalization, if it is co if it coexists with the physical loss of the universe, because in nature there is no multipolarity and neither in in the human spirit there is only uh there is uh uh only uh the earth is a polar world and and as the chinese uh law of change they call it the su yi uh, or i ching they say that uh that uh, you can bypass the multer pol uh, the polar uh, concept, but you have to go beyond uh, num be beyond the polar concept. It's not anymore pol uh, polar. It's passive. It's not anymore active. It's uh, it's beyond. So these are not active spaces on Earth. These are are passive uh, spaces on Earth. So I wanted to ask if the multipolar world of the alternative of globalization uh, being embraced in BRICS and the new Silk Road, if it is co if it coexists with uh, with the universal laws of physics and the human spirit. Okay. So actually, I would like to. I, I believe we also have Carolina on our Zoom call. So if she's on, and uh, we should test the translation first, I'd like to see if she would like to respond first and then open it up to the other panelists. So Carolina, are you on? Okay. It doesn't sound like it. Well, then what I'll do is I'm going to open up Vicente's question, which is really wonderful to the other panelists. And then if Carolina is on and we can get the translation going, uh, the interpretation going, then we'll do that. So actually, Lissy, would you like to, to answer that one? Start us off. I think we have to start from the standpoint of trying to understand uh, what the nature of the universe is and um, what, um, but so I don't think that we just look, um, you know, when we look at how um, life has been developing biologically, we see that um, a new solutions are found all the time in order to, you know, for life to manifest itself more and more effectively all the time. And that, um, you know, it's interesting how animal life and plants, they find new, uh, develop new biological technologies to, uh, in order to do that. But, um, but then the, the mind um, is superior to that and, uh, Benatsky, he discusses how you sudden, you have suddenly an explosion in the world because of uh, human cognition, that we make all these discoveries. And, uh, you know, he talks about the, 
yeah so so i i don't i don't think that you know the nature of a universe into a question of um multipolar or not i think what's interesting is um is our creative ability to um find solutions and to um manifest our ourselves and our 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 thoughts and ideas uh, more and more effectively in this universe. What do you think about that? Was it Vincente? Uh, yes. Uh, well, um, I, um, I think that the universe uh, um, is as Lyndon LaRouche said is negentropic and and uh, as we can see the uh, mathematics and its closed system of mathematics can't understand it because uh, it's uh, an entropic model so uh, um, I think uh, I was asking because uh, if uh if in politics and in the economy we create on earth a a uh embrace a new concept or an alternative of globalization based on the multipolar world idea um it is uh as we can see uh if we just study uh old uh civilizations they say that uh It is, it is proven scientifically, scientifically Earth is uh, polar, uh, is based on two poles and, and is the north and is the south. Uh, uh, this uh, is gravitational and electromagnetic. So uh, how uh, uh, I don't understand the concept of a multipolar world when uh, you want to embrace it on Earth and uh, I wanted to understand if this is an entropic uh, system or a negentropic system that can coexist with the universal laws of physics. Uh, this is in the aspects of politics, economy, uh, in in globalization. So uh, this is negentropic or uh, entropic. If she and if she has something to say in response to that, Carolina, can you hear us? <laughs> this is the interpreter. She will be on momentarily. I hope. Hola, Dennis, me escuchas? Hello, can I be heard? Uh, uh, yeah. We need to do one Gracias. thing. Gracias. Eh, yo lo que puedo Thank you. What I can say to you about this question is that is it be something you're going to have to discover this for yourself. You can discover this. We're working on Kepler, and that's the best method. There's a document that LaRouche wrote for all youth people who are younger than me, people young like you, and even for younger people. And it's called My Encounter with Leibniz and with Kepler, which is a document for young adults. So I'm not gonna save you the hard work that's required, but let's keep studying Kepler every Monday in the evening. And that's my answer to you. And thank you. OK, great. Daniel, you want to say something? Yeah, if I can, briefly. So um, I just want to re respond because this question of multipolar world and the idea of globalization, what do we mean when we say globalization? This is something that Helga LaRouche has referenced more than once. It is not her view, and I concur, that there is such a possibility of a multipolar world. In other words, one in which you have uh, multiple poles of influence uh, who are 
collaborating as opposed to it's meant to be in opposition to what's called the unip unipolar world, uh, which is where you have you know a, a collection of power in a in one center. Uh, neither of these theories of the world are really cohere with what is happening, which is that we live in an era of oligarchy, and one of the tools of oligarchy, which is, uh, in my view, centered in. groupings across the world, these institutions that Mrs. LaRouche in the first panel referred to as the British Empire, uh, that this is, uh, they, these, th this operation to suppress humanity is uh, the key enemy that we have. It's not a matter of one nation holding, you know, holding, uh, holding power over others, although the United States has often played the role of uh, the brawn for the British brains but rather it's a matter of yeah, creating a community of nation states, or as the president of China refers to it, a community of uh, shared destiny. Um, the community of, of principle is what John Quincy Adams called it. Uh, and that these nations, the point is that, and this is what I was trying to get across in my comments, if the whole purpose of a nation and the whole purpose of our republic here in the United States is to advance the pursuit of happiness, for our population, but it's based on the idea of universal rights of the individual that extend naturally beyond Americans per se, as Franklin emphasized, then we have a, you know, then we have the prospect of national governments working together for the common aims of humanity. And if we want to demonstrate that the world is not a closed system, not an entropic system, as you're raising, Vicente then it's my view that the strongest way to do that is to have collaboration between Russia, China, and the United States and other countries, all other countries that we possibly can bring into this on the exploration of the solar system and the galaxy. Because like, like Jose said, there's, a, there's some future in which we're all gonna have our own galaxy because there's two trillion galaxies out there and there's more than enough room for the for the human population to extend out there, and uh, and it's a demonstration that there's not such a thing as fixed resources or a closed system, or you know so that we have to manage through a unipolar or a multipolar system. What we need is uh, a, a level of recognition of sovereignty, uh, respect for the sovereign governments of many nations that they can. Uh, form agreements in which they can work together for the benefit of all. And, uh, and this realm of space science would be a great uh, frontier by which we could change everything. Okay, great. Okay, so now we're going to go to Calvin. Calvin, are you there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So mine is more of a question. Um, I think it was Dennis, I'm not sure who said this, but um, um, there was a comment that one of the guys made about people are becoming slaves of like social networks and social platforms. And he further went on to criticize young people for making a, you know, a huge amount of money by doing things such as like selling makeup and making online videos. And that criticism about the way people choose to make money kind of reminded me of a conversation I had with someone last week about like how Uber and Lyft, like how when people do Uber and Lyft, those aren't like really like real jobs. They aren't really productive. Um, it doesn't provide a sense of security for people. Um, and we talk about a lot of advances, but me personally, um, I see a lot of advances um, in this society, technologically and non-technologically in both ways. Um, and I do think the result of some of these advances led to, you know, some of the way people choose to make money. But my question is, um, what's wrong with people, you know, making making money off of, you know, like selling videos and, you know, maybe doing Uber or Lyft and things like that? Um, I don't know, because it seems like I'm all for the 1.5 billion jobs, the industrial jobs and stuff like that. But I think some people have to be realistic. Not everyone wants an industrial job. Um, some people are satisfied with selling makeup for the rest of their lives and stuff like that. So I'm just, I'm just trying to understand 
what's wrong really with, you know, making money off of making videos and, you know, stuff like that. Okay, Sharin, that sounds if like that that's... question makes sense. I know it was all over the place. I hope it made that sense makes to sense. me. <laughs> okay, <laughs> Sharin, I think that maybe we start with you. That's your your territory there. Yes. Um, I think that uh, there is um, a common point between this and uh, in the past uh, when people had uh, still productive jobs, um, the, um, the less uh, educated was uh, workers were workers, and the, the more educated ones were the bosses. And um, it, it's uh, to say to simplify, but. Um, that was uh, the question because uh, you asked to yourself, uh, I, does I need to? Do I need to to find a job uh, by on my own? And uh, the society uh, won't help me, so I uh, I have to fight for for my future on my own. And the question today is uh, quite the same. Uh, if I I will use all all my um, my means on my own. Uh, if I can make video in my room, in my bedroom, uh, in my uh, bathroom, <laughs> I will make it, and I will earn my uh, my uh, my life. And uh, if I have more uh, uh, skills, uh, I can uh, I can uh, produce uh, uh, some software. I can produce some application. I can invent something. And. Uh, all that is the same uh, direction. There is no collective uh, um, work, mm -hmm. and we have to work on the, on this uh, this issue. Yeah, Sarah. Oh, we can't hear you. Try unmuting. No, we can't hear you. Is your microphone muted on the call there? No, we can't hear you. Hmm. Okay, try now. No, I don't know what happened. It says uh, for a second you were unmuted and then it muted again. No. Why don't we work on your audio and we'll go to somebody else and come back to you. So Jose, why don't you go ahead and we'll work on Sarah's audio. Sure. First of all, Calvin, always a pleasure talking to you, pal. Um, I, I I actually had this conversation with a few friends the other day. Is it immoral to to want to make a living for yourself and want the best conditions for yourself if that involves you working a menial job or you know selling content, whether that be stupid videos on the internet or whether that be um, uh, dirty pictures and videos on the internet? And uh, my point is simple. I think you're worth more than that. I think you're worth more than a nine to five. And I think you're worth more than any salary or any amount of money that you could ever make in the world. I think everybody is worth a dollar amount. But where is that worth? And that worth is in the soul and in the mind. That's what makes you beautiful. And uh, I'm simply saying the country needs the means to develop that beauty that lies within everybody. That's where your real worth is. You could die with $50 million in your bank account, five homes on Beverly, in, in the Beverly Hills, 20 cars, luxury cars. I think Jay Leno has a, a robot that he can use. None of that will mean anything. You die and then not, not, you, 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 you contributed nothing. Is that what you want your life to mean? Because Life is not defined by the present, but the future. And if you live in the present, you will die when you die. 
But if you live in the future, will you become immortal? And that's really where um, a true beauty and meaning in your life exists in the future. So that's my response to you, Calvin. Okay, Sarah, can we try your audio again? Wait, can you hear me? Oh, hold on just a second, Calvin. Let's see if Sarah's audio okay. is working. Go ahead, Sarah. No, it's not working again. Okay, yeah. Calvin, did you want to say something in response to Jose while we continue to work on yes, Sarah's audio? Um, <laughs> um, yes, Jose, I truly and honestly agree with everything you say 100%. But maybe it's just me. I don't know if it's bias on my end or anything, but I think those jobs have value. I mean, it's good to live for the future, but I think we also have to live for now. Um, I'm using a few of the examples. Um, Uber and Lyft, for example. Not everyone is in a position to afford a course. Some people need to get a job. Um, it's more affordable than catching a cab. Um, selling makeup. I mean, that's a huge industry, and, you know, the makeup industry is a huge one in America right now. I mean, we have beauty standards in America, unfortunately. I mean, you have to look a certain kind of way to get a job, have a certain kind of hairstyle to get a job. I mean, these are things, these are jobs that kind of help satisfy those requirements to get those jobs or get to work and things like that. So don't you think it's a bit, I don't know, I mean, odd to say that those jobs have no value when they in a way satisfy certain things that are needed today. I don't know, if, hope that makes sense, but you know, that's what I'm saying about those. I think those jobs that people consider unworthy or worthy. Oh, Franklin, did you want to say something in response to Calvin? Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, I, I, I totally understand uh, where Calvin is coming from. Um, I am a content producer, by the way. I produce music, uh, gospel music, when I'm not doing uh, youth engagement work. Mm -hmm. And what I can say is that um, I think what I heard the contributor saying is that it, it, does, it, it is not bad to be making content and to be spending your time using your talent, whatever it is, to get a living and also, as Jose is saying, explore your your creative aspect. But what I see most young people doing is that it only they see it as a means to an end. It stops there. The intellect is not growing because yes, you can be making music, but also develop your mind because when you look at how even structures are, uh, I think. Uh, if I forgot her name, one of the contributors was saying in the in the, in the medieval times and even as the world economies was de was was, de was developing, the ones whose intellect was more developed were the bosses, and then the rest of them were the peasants. Sadly, that's how the world is. When your intellect uh, and your ingenuity is not explored to the fullest, you are, so to speak. Uh, confined to now trying to just get the, the menial crumbs of the economy, yet we could do much better. In Africa, for example, let, let, let me give uh, our context, for example. P, uh, we are, uh, a lot of youth are spending more time trying to be YouTubers, trying to be, uh, to be on TikTok. It's not bad, but we could be doing so much more, like exploring farming opportunities, exploring opportunities to be computer scientists. So that is the whole aspect. We are not saying that, yes, content production is not bad, but let us do more. And with that, we will open up a whole new uh, basket of opportunities for the economy. That is my input. Thank you very much. So, oh, Lissy, go ahead. Hold on. There, you can hear me now, right? Yeah. All right. So, um, yeah, I just have a question for you, Kevin, because um, um, what what kind of uh, culture, what kind of, uh, you know, thinking is needed among, uh, you know, people uh, today and in the future for us to face a situation in two billion years where the sun uh, will burn out. Now, how will we solve that? So 
yes, uh, we have creative abilities. We can um, we can solve. You know, we have the ability to solve problems. But what kind of culture do we need uh, in order to do that? So many um, many um, animal species uh, went extinct, and if we uh, are not if we're not acting uh, on a higher level, if we're just, you know, acting on some kind of, uh, you know, basis or something, you know, where we're not developing and making new discoveries and, and you know, create, developing in a way that will make us able to um, solve that uh, crisis in two billion years, then um, we could go extinct. So what's special about a man is our mind. So that's the most precious thing we have. And therefore I think that, you know, uh, uh, in terms of necessity, necessity changes. One person can make a new discovery that, that makes a lot of, uh, you know, s sort of uh, what you can call practi practical jobs or, or anything obsolete. Um, so yeah so what do you think i mean what what kind of thinking do you think is needed uh for facing that in two billion years um well okay um critical thinking um logical thinking i mean most definitely some form of intellectual um thinking would need be needed to at least see that kind of future or contribute to that kind of future. So it would most definitely be a culture of critical thinking. That's my answer to the question. Yeah, well, we have to look, you know, it's not an easy question. So we really have to look into how, how do we answer that question? And, uh, you know, Lynn had a, a, a huge attack on the educational system because you have this, uh, what's it called, drill, drill method where people have to learn as if they're sort of like a box that you just fill with thing and you basically just have to learn like a dog that learns tricks and um but he actually was uh, challenging people uh, especially young people to go through the discovery so who made the biggest changes um uh, for mankind who revolutionized who who had these huge uh how do you say um um large scale geological influence uh, uh on behalf of mankind and um carolina was talking about kepler who discovered how the uh about, um, the solar system works so uh so so we should look at those people that actually did change physically and uh, through the new sphere um uh and redefined sort of yeah that actually redefined mankind the meaning of mankind and the role of mankind and the future of mankind and look at how did they think we should rediscover their discoveries um and you know so that we actually become also qualified to answer that question what do you think okay let's see if um can we see if sarah's audio is working now are you hearing me? Oh, yes. Wonderful. Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, to answer to that question, I think that the problem is uh, deeper than just selling products. I think that the problem is the fact that what kind of society are we thinking if we just reduce all our visions to social media? I mean, this is, um, we are we are encouraging a lack of ambitions. We are encouraging um, this idea of easy money, uh, of not developing our minds because we can, we can just have a normal life by selling projects on, I don't know, Instagram or something. I think that the problem is that we are not educating people if they think that there is a future in that type of work. It can be a first step. You can like sell products to 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 win money to create another project but it can't be a vision this is so um this is not this is not the way uh we should imagine a society this is so small i mean and not rich at all and yeah 
social, social media are a part of our, our lives now. We can learn to live. We have to learn to live with it, but we can't make it the major part, part of uh, our visions. Um, I do not agree with that because I don't want my society to to not be educated and to dream about selling products and nothing more. This is what I had to say. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, um, so we have a question, I think, from Joshua Kisubika, if he's still in the Zoom. Are you there, Joshua? Okay, maybe not. In that case, um, I think what I'm going to do is, um, I think I'm going to read Andrea, one. Can you hear me? Oh, good. Yes, we can hear you. Why don't you go ahead? Okay. So I, I just wanted to pose a question to Daniel, maybe, uh, just to get to know how the position of uh, the Law Institute to support the youth in Uganda. Please go ahead. It was just a question to you. Uh, oh, I see. Would you like me to read from what you wrote? Or, or why don't you go ahead and, and please read that? Oh, OK. So uh, uh, I was saying, I was saying that uh, over say, 700 uh, how then people reach working age every year in Uganda. And this is expected to rise to an average of 1 million in a decade from 2030 to 2040. And it's already creating a mismatch between labor demand and supply. And uh, while Uganda's uh, youth are renowned for being highly enterprising, fewer than 4% of Ugandans are employers. 52 are working for themselves only, and 43% are unpaid family workers. So, and you can see that even this, uh, 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 it all goes back to maybe leadership. So I was trying to, to look at which strategies can we best identify uh, uh, together with you to hope the youth in Uganda uh, to, 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 to start living life to the full. Thank you very much, Joshua. I think that what you're raising is a prospect of, uh, of dialogue and discussion about, most importantly, perhaps, as we are discussing here, the epistemology of economics because what you're describing uh, it depends on your point of view the point of view expressed by this British imperial oligarchical financial system is the point of view that uh, if you have many many mouths to feed and you don't have enough food or that is to say if you have many youth to employ but you don't have enough jobs then that means that you're poor but from the standpoint of the American system, or I would say, which is this, to say a specific, I'm not referring to what the United States has been doing recently or even over most of its history, but rather the so-called American system of economics from Alexander Hamilton, which has been developed by uh, Lincoln's economists, developed under Franklin Roosevelt, developed under John Kennedy, and in particular by Linton LaRouche as an economist and an individual, under that system, then you look at a large number of youth and you say, my goodness, what incredible wealth we have because of the creative powers of their minds. And because we understand, as Hamilton did, that it's through the function of the human mind making discoveries that we actually are able to increase our uh, wealth, our ability to provide for the population and for the future populations. So, if we approach the circumstance from that respect, then we will immediately begin to look at what are the great projects that need to be built. 
that would establish a new platform of infrastructure, a new platform of capability for the nation and for the region and for the continent and therefore for the world, which provide a basis for new qualities of economic activity that otherwise were not possible. That you create uh, a future with a future. You create some kind of next step for the whole system. But it's most important that this be uh, under the idea of a leapfrog, that we have to go, we say leapfrog to signify, go beyond any of the so-called intermediate steps that the IMF demands that people take, which is total nonsense. You may have seen on panel one that uh, Daisuke Kotagawa, from, former Japanese representative to the IMF, uh, dealt with this idea, uh, that it's ridiculous that we should be you know, expecting nations to go step by step by step up the ladder of industrialization and so forth. That's nonsense. We should go to the highest technology that's available and overmaster all of the problems that have come before and go for the most rapid possible uh, advance of capability, of productive capability in particular. And so what we would like to discuss with you would be what are the principles by which this can be achieved in Uganda, in the region, in the, in the continent and in the world? And what are we demanding from governments? Uh, that's why presently, given the conditions of total breakdown of the system, which is what we're faced with right now, we're saying we really have got to bring forward youth leadership to demand this summit, a summit of the, of the nations that are capable of initiating a new paradigm. Because if we wanna get that kind of project rolling, and that kind of new platform, then we're gonna to have to change the whole financial system. We cannot allow the continued suffocation of the developing uh, countries, so-called. We've got to get, really what the Schiller Institute is proposing is one and a half billion new jobs. And the discussion is that this could mean $125 trillion of credit, international credit, provided by international credit institutions to nations. So we'd like to discuss this with you and the youth that you work with and uh, provide a basis for a uh, dialogue in which we can have shared understanding of what is necessary. And then you know, have, have a basis by which to demand that of the government there and of the people of the world and the governments of the world. Thank you very much for participating. All right, thank you very much, both of you. So we have unfortunately come up on time, and that's very unfortunate because we have many more people who I know have questions both live and we also got a number of email questions which we don't have time to take uh, on this panel right now. I would encourage everyone who did not get an opportunity to ask a question to send your question in. We will direct it to the panelists uh, so that we can continue this really fun, fruitful, and important dialogue. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each of the panelists who are who remain with us uh, if they'd like to say anything in closing before we end our panel. So um, why don't we go to Sharin and see if you'd like to say anything before we close out? Yes, I just would like to uh, to uh, emphasize on the question of leadership and uh, say one thing: once you have discovered uh, a kind of truth, a kind of um, uh, what the direction uh, the society uh, is. You, uh, you maybe you didn't uh, aim to um, to uh, to take leadership, but uh, uh, this uh, this fate coming on you uh, owes you to to take leadership. Okay, Lissy, would you like to say something? Um, well, uh, to all youth, I would just like to say that, you know, um, you know, we, um, we will all become uh, very old and wrinkled and ugly and all that at the, you know, and in the old age. And so the question is, when you are there, can you, you know, can you uh, think about your life and say that, you know, certainly I'm 
you know, my life was important and I am not just going to be a uh, worm food. Yeah, that's all. Okay. Why don't we go to Carolina next? Let's see if you'd like to say something to close us out. Can I be heard? Yes. I think that I appreciate and thank everyone for having participated in this. I'm very happy. This is the first time we've had a forum of this sort of youth. And I think that what's helped me to understand and organize youth is to not be judgmental, but to actually try to inspire them, to view them from the standpoint of agape, of love. And if, if we see the pain of seeing youth who are on drugs or doing those kinds of things, if this causes pain, we have to realize that perhaps there's something better that's an option. So I think that we should take the occasion to try to give them the communicate the idea that we can change all of this. We have tremendous potential. The more people die from drugs in the streets, the worse it is. Rather, they can have lives based on creativity and agape towards others. So thank you very much for this seminar and this webinar. Thank you. Jose? Oh, we can't hear you, Jose. Are you muted? Your microphone is muted, according to the technical genius over here. No? OK, well, let's work on that. Let's go to Sarah. Would you like to say something to close out? Yeah, I think this is extremely amazing to be all ga gathered today to fight for our ideas and for a better world. This is so powerful and inspiring at the same time. I'm, I'm really happy that we're slowly changing our world and, and I'm glad to be a part of that change. That's it. Thank you. Okay, Jose, have we fixed your audio? No. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go to Daniel and we'll give you one more chance. Daniel, go ahead. Thank you. I want to echo what Sara said. I totally agree. It's, uh, you know, it's inspiring. It sets, it sets a standard that encourages us to go higher. And so I just want to quote the immortal words of Lyndon LaRouche, have fun. <laughs> Great. Okay, Jose, last chance. I think you should quit the oh. call and then come back. This is what okay. I did. Think like Beethoven. <laughs> okay. So I'd like to thank everyone, all the panelists, everyone who got on to ask questions. And I'd like to thank our audience for, um, for watching today. Let me put out a call, get active. If you're young, if you're old, get active with the Schiller Institute. We need you to become a member of the Schiller Institute. We need you to sign and circulate our petition for a global health system. We need you to circulate our program for 1.5 billion productive jobs. And we need you to organize. So thank you very much. Thank you to everyone who watched the conference today. And uh, we'll see you again soon. <laughs>